Germany is facing a budget crisis following an emergency spending freeze. Europe's biggest and the world's third largest economy is in trouble. It seems to have run out of money that it needs for modernizing its infrastructure and for achieving its climate targets. Germany likes to be seen as a global climate leader. It has plans to become carbon neutral in the next couple of decades, a plan that now looks far-fetched. While other countries like the US and China are investing heavily in their infrastructure for a better future. Germany, on the other hand, is having to save money and cut costs. So today on To The Point, we are discussing problems made in Germany. No more money for the future. Hello and welcome to To The Point. I am Isha Bhatia San here in Berlin. And before we dig deeper, let me quickly introduce my guest to you. We have Matthew Karnichnik. He is Politico's chief Europe correspondent. Next on the panel is Arne Delves, who is a reporter with Bloomberg. And DW's political correspondent, Leonie von Hammerstein. A very warm welcome to you all. Let's start with the basics. Let's see what has happened. So there have been these 60 billion euros that were there for COVID fund. They were unused. And the government decided to transfer them to Climate and Transformation Fund. And then the highest court said that that is illegal, that is unconstitutional. Matthew, what kind of impact is this ruling going to have now? It's having a devastating impact because the German government no longer has the money that it needs to fund the climate projects that they were planning in order to reach the goals that you you've outlined. And there is no easy way for them to find this money in the budget now because Germany has a, a deficit limit. They've put in what they call a debt break, which means that the government can't spend more really than what it what it brings in. And so it's it's really not clear at the moment how the government is going to resolve this because you're not going to be able to find 60 billion uh, very easily. Maybe we can talk about the debt break a little late, uh, later. Leonie, Germany has set really big targets for itself. Now, by 2045, it wants to be carbon neutral. But there are projections now that show that Germany might not even be able to achieve targets for 2030, which is um, to generate 80% of electricity from renewables. So is there a plan B? That's a very good question. Um, I, I feel like at the moment um, there isn't really a plan B. And when we see, when we look at the government, I mean, next to sort of what's happening on the ground, there's also a political crisis happening in the governing coalition. They, um, these three parties that are together in a coalition, have very different ideas about how Germany is going to achieve that transition in the next couple of years, with what instrument, um, policy instruments, and fiscal instruments. And and there's a lot of infighting, and we can see um, the polls show that. The parties that are winning from that infighting in the in the government are the parties, the conservative CDU, CSU, and the far right AFD. So the government is really under pressure to come up with its plan B and to communicate it effectively to its population. There is a lot of pressure now. Germany, as I said, is the third largest economy in the world, but at the same time, Germany is also the country that. Um, there's only 2% of global carbon emissions that uh, it results in. So should Germany really be bothered or should Germany prioritize economy over climate now? I think you cannot really do this contradiction or it, it's not a contradiction, of course, because the promise has always been that this green transformation also yields green growth. So the, in an ideal world, which we maybe not, don't live in, we now realize um, the, the, the green transformation would have been a new economic miracle. That was actually, I think, Olaf Scholz even said that. And now we realize uh, maybe that's not really working out. It's not working out. So let's have a quick recap of what has happened. On the 15th of November, Germany's top court ruled the government's budget unconstitutional. It had moved left over emergency funds from the COVID pandemic to a fund to counter climate change and to modernize the country. This decision has left a hole of 60 billion euros in the government's budget and a disaster for Scholz's coalition that comprises of the Social Democrats, that's SPD, Greens, 
and the Liberal FDP. Germany needs money. The Ministry of Finance's budget is 60 billion euros short, and it needs that money for a climate fund to oversee the economic and industrial transition to green energy. The government was caught off guard, now it's stumped. But almost two weeks after the judge's ruling, Chancellor Olaf Scholz is now spreading his message of optimism around the Bundestag. We must now invest heavily in modernizing Germany. We must now ensure that we manage the transformation of our economy in Germany and remain competitive as a strong industrialized country. In the year to come, around 19 billion euros should be spent on improving heat insulation in buildings. Billions must also be invested to support the industry itself so that steel companies don't need to depend on fossil fuels. As well as toward establishing microchip factories and assisting the automotive industry. Will Germany succeed? And if not, will the country be threatened by industrial decline? Mathieu, how do you see that? I think Germany is already threatened by industrial decline, to be honest. And I think we've been seeing this over the past several years. You're seeing a kind of deindustrialization happening in Germany because energy prices have already been quite high here in comparison to, to other parts of the world, in particular North America. So what you've seen is a lot of big German companies, um, such as uh, the chemical maker BASF, which many viewers might be familiar with, have been investing more in Asia and North America than they have in in Europe and in Germany in particular, but it's not just those companies, it's also the automakers, it's, it's, it's uh, Volkswagen, it's uh, Daimler, BMW, etc. They're still producing in Germany, but when they think about where they're going to expand around the world, they're not thinking about Europe, they're looking elsewhere, partly because energy prices here are so high. You've given some concrete examples now, talking specifically about this money. That was the budget was also allocated for um, modernizing in a way uh, that there were semiconductor factories. It was also the railways, uh, battery factories. So, what is going to happen to all of these projects now? I think these projects are not going to happen because of the the legal constraints around it. The court has said you cannot use this money. That means that the 60 billion is not available. At the same time, they have this deficit limit, these these debt controls, which means that they can't go outside of the normal budget. Because the way to think about it was that there were there were two pots. There was the normal budget in which there's 460 billion euros that the German government has to spend, and then there was this extra budget of 60 billion. But of the 460 billion, the German government only has 10% of that that it can use freely. And that's why the 60 billion was going to be so important. Without that money and with the legal constraints, it's going to be impossible to do so because the three parties in this coalition can't agree on a solution. There would be solutions, but those potential solutions are not acceptable to at least one of the parties in, in, in the coalition. So it's very difficult to see how they're going to get out of this. I think it's more likely they're just going to limp along for the next couple of years until there's a new election until there's a new election. Now, the opposition is already saying that there should be new elections and as soon as possible. Do you think that's going to happen? And if yes, will that change anything? I don't think that's going to happen because none of the three parties in government at the moment have any interest in, in calling snap elections because they would lose, basically. Um, and I think, you know, all representatives of, of all three parties have come out and say that they they still, at the moment, still want to work together. Um, I think um, within the parties, there's a lot of pressure also on the party leadership. Um, sort of the, the party's basis, especially with, with free Democrats, is putting a lot of pressure on the leadership and, and saying maybe we, we shouldn't be in this coalition. But in the polls, we see that it would be very difficult for the FDP to really cross the 5% threshold if they were to have new elections, fresh elections. I do think it is important to talk about the options that are on the table. Um, it seems politically impossible. There, there needs to be political will, obviously, to follow these options through. But there are ideas, suggestions um, on the table to, to find that money. One example would be um, what many are suggesting is to, to cut subsidies for climate damaging um, so climate damaging subsidies and, and to, to take that money um, for, for the fund. Another, another idea that has been put forward by some economists has been to create sort of a special fund similar to what Germany created for the Bundeswehr, its military, um, the 100 billion to create it for the climate. And there too, I think it is interesting that, that Germany's top court kind of has also given an argument in favor of creating such a fund when two years... It, 
in 2021, two years ago, um, in this historical ruling, it basically said the German government is not doing enough to protect future generations' well-being and to do something about about the climate. It's not, um, yeah, it should do more. So there's another top court ruling that basically could be used as a as a foundation to argue for for such a fund. But obviously, it's difficult to achieve that with the political parties and, and their stance on that as it stands right now. And also what has happened today is that a Berlin court has ordered Germany to set up a climate action plan to ensure the country cuts carbon emissions in the traffic and construction sectors. You're already smiling. What's happening? There's one court saying you have to save money or you can't use the money. The other court saying you got to spend more. How is the government going to make sense of all of this? Yeah, it seems a bit right now that the courts have become like the, the, the enemies also of this government, it seems. Um, I, I think what the court has decided today uh, is in a way almost common sense. We have to do something about climate change. Of course, this government has to do something. And I think originally this government has also was also willing to do that. But now, of course, first of all, I think they have lost the people's support for this, the, the, the fight against climate change is not, just not a, a popular fight anymore. And secondly, we have the financial problem. So, and we have all these tensions within this government. So I think the chances that the government will fulfill this court's order are relatively small right now. And in parliament, Scholz claimed that no matter what, uh, investment will continue. Although he did not really uh, specifically say anything how he's going to do that. What do you make of it? What is his plan going to be like? That's a very good question. I think what uh, Olaf Scholz wants to project is sort of this security, stability. I mean, that is his communication style, but um, but they don't really have a plan yet. And I don't think we'll see one um, <laughs> until next year, early next year. Um, so, yeah, it, it, I mean, that, that, is, that is really kind of like Olaf, Olaf Scholz in action. Um, because I think, as you said, he also realizes that um, the population, the mood in the population is shifting. Um, it's shifting away from that, you know, from trust in the government. People are losing trust in, in the government's doing and in their ability to handle this, um, to handle this. So I think, yeah, it's more, of a, it's more of a communication trick than actually a plan. But it's not working. It's not really working. I think they really have to come up with a plan in order for it to work. <laughs> would, you, would you say that there's a crisis fatigue with mm. the population if you say that it's not working with the, uh, with the people? I think so. I think what we've seen this year with this controversial heating law um, that Robert Habeck, Germany's uh, economy and climate minister, suggested and where there were a lot of details unclear um, and and you could really see how the debate was sort of polarizing. And I think it's interesting that in polls, when people are asked, um, a lot of them theoretically in Germany still support Germany's transition, uh, energy transition, but then... Um, but they, they don't support the Greens Exactly, <laughs> and they, they don't really support their government's handling of it. So I think Germans really want to have a plan. They want to have a plan that makes sense and that is clearly communicated. And I think it is, it is a very challenging transformation. It's also challenging to communicate that, but I think climate good... Good politics has to communicate, sort of has to bridge the gap between uh, between the theoretical approval of um, climate friendly policies and then the actual willingness to also change something about their own consumption and, and their lives. I mean, this is really going to affect how people heat their homes, how they um, move, <laughs> you know, going their to mobility, them it's going to affect yeah, right. their yeah. lives. You, you say that's uh, Scholz's way of communication. But in his way of communication, what I found interesting was uh, when he talked of the new reality. Now, he said that had we known about this reality, our decisions would have been different two years back when we came in power. He's talking about uh, his own constitution and laws that exist there. Isn't that embarrassing for a government to say that for two years they haven't understood what their laws are like? I think it's more than embarrassing, which is why I don't think it really is a communication problem. This is the way they've tried to justify it and all of the problems they've had saying, oh, we, we just are not communicating it. I think the problem is, is that they have a plan that has proved to be unworkable. Um, you can, uh, you know, argue about w what is actually necessary in terms of climate policy. I think there's a consensus in this country that they do need to meet the international uh, targets that they have agreed to. But the question is, how do you get there and how do you get there 
quickly. And so far, successive German governments have proved to be uh, incompetent in that regard. And I think what has surprised many people about this latest episode is that the government knew this court case was going to be argued in front of the constitutional court. They knew there was a risk that the court would rule against them. And they went ahead without a plan B. They continued to count on the 60 billion, which was really the foundation of this coalition. Without that 60 billion, this coalition would have never come to be. And they went ahead anyway, and Schultz, who has the reputation of being a, a know-it-all, um, thought that he knew better than people who were warning him against it, and, 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 and he went forward. And, and the Greens went forward, too, willingly, because they have their um, sort of climate goals uh, in, 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 in their focus, uh, which is understandable, but they ignored all of the voices around them saying, this might not work and you need to have a fallback plan. There is no fallback plan. And this is why they are facing this, this crisis now. Now, you mentioned the debt break earlier. Um, that's something that's very peculiar to Germany. None of the G7 countries have that kind of a limit. So should that be reformed? Would that help the government? Well, I, I think that would be up to the Germans to decide. But the, the reality is that they introduced the debt break in 2009. That was during the financial crisis then, where Germany had spent uh, tens of billions of dollars to prop up its banks. And there was a sense in the country then that they needed to keep the government from overspending. And so they anchored this debt break in the Constitution with the agreement of the main parties of the Social Democrats and the Christian Democrats at the time. So Schultz's party agreed to it too by a wide margin. Uh, the, the world has changed. In those intervening years, Germany d did very well economically. The most people, I think, here forgot about the debt break because the economy was firing on all cylinders. They were uh, recording one surplus after another. Uh, in 2018 alone, they had a surplus of something like 58 billion euros. So they didn't have to worry about this. But once COVID hit, then things looked a, a, a bit different and the government had to come in with this extraordinary support. And now the, the economy is still stagnating. They don't have the surplus anymore. Uh, but the, the irony of this whole thing is, is that Germany doesn't have financial problems. I mean, that's not the way to look at it. It has one of the best fiscal positions of any country in Europe. They can afford to spend. Germany has the highest possible credit rating that a country can have. Uh, so it would have no difficulty going out and borrowing five times, ten times the 60 billion that it needs now without damaging its, its credit rating. Uh, but it is really, it's more this kind of psychological barrier that Germans have, this obsession with debt, the sense that debt is something you know, evil uh, that uh, has brought them to this point. And it could prove to be their undoing if they don't decide to release this debt break. All right. So we've been talking a lot about funds and money. Uh, but what you also need to modernize a country is workforce. And data shows that Germany is going to face or is facing a lot of shortage. There's a recent study by Bettelsmann uh, that says that by 2030, there would be 300,000 less skilled workers. So how is Germany planning on um, achieving its targets, and especially in renewables, when there's going to be such a big shortage? Yeah. I am. One of the few good things the Scholz government has done is actually a reform of the workforce immigration law, which may, will make it easier for people uh, to find work here. The problem is that there are not too many people who right now are willing to come to Germany because there are more attractive uh, places in the world where you can also find work. What we are dealing now is, is a big refugee wave. We, and, and of course, people find out, oh, yeah, but the people, the migrants who are coming here uh, cannot really do these jobs because they are not really skilled labor. And we have a, also this moral discourse in Germany. You have to help people, but you are not really allowed to choose who's coming into your country. Other countries do it a bit differently, maybe also more smartly. We don't, and therefore we, you know, have actually many migrants coming here, which, but who won't really solve our workforce problem. We're also having this discussion at a time when COP28 is taking place in Dubai. Now, if Germany's lost its credibility, if I may call it that, or if I may call it a blunder, after this, 
Will Germany be able to convince other countries to raise their climate targets, Leonie? That's a very good question. It certainly is going to try to do so. And I think it is interesting to observe how Germany is acting on an, on the international level and then and what the discussion is there and what role kind of it has there and then on an internal domestic level. Um, and I think Team Germany, as, as they call themselves, because there's a huge delegation going to COP, um, wants to really enter into energy partnerships. It has kind of emphasized that it wants to show solidarity, especially with countries in the global south, and help them with their energy transition. Um, but yeah, I mean, the credit credibility problem is not really new because um, when it enters into, into discussions with countries like India um, and says, well, maybe you should phase out coal, um, then obviously the answer is you're still burning coal. Um, and that has been a problem. I mean, Germany is still reliant on, on fossil fuels themselves. So the credibility problem is not only new after this budget crisis, it's existed for a while. Right. So Germany clearly is in a fix, while other countries and especially the US and China are making big leaps. They have understood that the future lies in moving away from fossil fuels. The sooner they modernize their infrastructure, the better it is for the economies. And unlike Germany, they aren't waiting for any tables to turn. They are busy taking action now. They may walk side by side, but they still stand apart on many issues. China's President Xi and US President Biden had a meeting in mid-November. Regardless of their differences, they do have one thing in common. Both want to move away from fossil fuels and restructure their economies. To achieve this, they are spending hundreds of billions in taxpayers' money and subsidies, both in their home countries and abroad. We have to keep going. Above all, it shows us that climate action offers an opportunity for the nation to come together and do some really big things. China is funding its autocratic economy in large part with taxpayers' money, which is being used to boost the solar and automotive industries. And in the US, the president is spending $738 billion to reorganize the economy. Can the German government still keep up? Or has the Federal Republic already been left behind? Ah, no. Well, <laughs> let me say it with a, with a really interesting picture or image uh, our economy minister Habeck recently painted, where he said, you know, we are like this debt break makes Germany like, like, a, like a boxer who enters a boxing ring with his hands tied behind his back, you know? while the others, he meant China and the US, for example, put like horseshoes into their boxing shoes, uh, boxing gloves. And I think it's actually very true. I mean, you, right now, we are standing in our own way a bit with these court rulings, and, but also with our laws, which first of all, the government has created, um, and which, doesn't enable us to actually invest money, invest money into these uh, future technologies and markets. And uh, as, as uh, Matthew said, I mean, it, there is Germany could easily get money on the on the on the on the markets, you know, but we can't. We are not allowed. Moving from Germany to US and China, now when Xi Jinping and Biden met recently, they both laid a lot of emphasis on how they wanted COP28 to be a success. And now Biden is not even going to Dubai. What kind of message do you think that sends across? Well, I think it sends the message that the United States is not particularly um, focused on what the UN is doing. It's looking at what it what it's doing itself. This has been kind of a tradition in the US where these international agreements have not been as important in the American context as they have been internationally. But I think if you look at the numbers in the US, emissions are coming down. There are these huge subsidy programs now that are going to drive the green transition. But um, I, I guess the determination was that uh, you know, there, there are more important things for him to focus on at home than uh, going to Dubai. And at least he saved the the air fuel that uh, and the, the CO2 and the carbon footprint, footprint uh, <laughs> by, by not going. 
Last I think, can I yeah, yeah, yes, make course. a point about that? I, I think what is interesting about the US example and the IRA is how, how the US managed to internally frame the trans energy transition really as sort of this big project where there's a creation of, of work, of work um, you know, it's a, it's a good thing for, for the industries in those areas to really invest money there, which is unusual for US, for US government to do that. Um, and I think Germany in many ways can learn from that to get the communication right, to get the framing right. So cost cutting or further investment? What's the need of R for Germany? I'd say the need is for the government to find a plan and to find that money to, to make the investments that are necessary in order to meet its climate targets. And will Germany be able to achieve the 2045 target of um, being uh, neutral? I don't think so. Not with the numbers now and the measures taken now. No. So you're not very hopeful about it. <laughs> so that's all the time we have. Will the German government manage to keep its targets? Will it be able to modernize its infrastructure? What do you think about it? If you're watching us on YouTube, do let us know your thoughts. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.